lot of the doors that I think we're going to walk, walk through later. So, um, I find that work. Yes, it did. I think that most people think of story as a sequence of events, right? If you ask an average person what a story is, they're going to say a story is that first A happens, and then because A happens, B happens, and then because B happens, C happens, and so on and so forth until nothing happens because the story's over, which is fair because that's what story's always been. That's what a movie is. That's what a book is. Right? But that definition and that idea of a story is this, and it works this way, became really problematic for us when we started making games because we just discovered that a game is not inherently a sequence of anything. A game is an environment. And inside that environment, the player gets to do whatever they want, so long as they abide by the rules of the game. So it creates a situation in which, okay, <laughs> um, it creates a situation in which I, as the writer, now don't get to decide first A happens, then B happens, then C happens. Because instead, the player gets to decide first A happens, because that's how the game starts. But then that looks fun, so then F happens. And then I wandered towards W for about 45 minutes, right? We, as a writer, can still create a sequence if we feel a need to by inflicting cutscenes on the game, which I don't mean to poop on cutscenes. There's a time and a place for a good cutscene, and we'll talk about when that is. But using that to solve the problem of the fact that this isn't a sequence anymore, and I don't know how to tell the story without it, still has a lot of problems the vast majority of the time the player's sitting there with the controller, they're in gameplay. I don't know what's happening. I have lost my ability to tell a story by making a sequence of things happen. Which doesn't mean we can't still tell a story. We can tell a story instead through the environment, because that's what we do have overt control over. We control exactly how that looks, exactly how that behaves, how it reacts to what the player decides to do. But in doing that, we have to sort of let go of the definition of story as the sequential thing and define it as something else. Not that's more correct or less correct, but that's more useful to us for what we're going to do. So what helps me do that, what helps me wrap my head around this, is something that I first read about in Jesse Shell's book, The Art of Game Design. If you haven't read it, it's really, really great. He's my hero. You should read it. But in this book, he talks about something called experience design, which is sort of a philosophy of design. It's about how you approach your game. And the idea is that really what we want to do, what we want to do as game designers is we want to give people an experience. We have a way of feeling a sensation or a way of feeling about ourselves in the world that's in our head. We know this feeling and we want to give other people that feeling. The problem is that an experience is not a physical, tangible thing. You can't give someone a box with an experience inside. We have to create an object. And what kind of object we create depends on what kind of artist we are. If you're a painter, you make a portrait. If you're a game designer, you make a game. But the idea is you make an object that can be distributed to a lot of people and then if you're good at what you do, when people interact with the object you made, in our case, the game, they will have the experience that you intended them to have. So it's this idea that, yes, we are making a game, but the real reason we're making a game is because we want to create an experience. And the experience we want to create is defining how we decide what to do with our game. We make decisions about game design based on what we want the end experience to be like. Thinking about story in that sort of ethereal, experiential way helps me. And before I give you my idea of just what we're going to define as story for this talk, if there's anything we've learned about working with story in games in the last couple of years, it's that story is a lot more things than we initially thought it was. Story is very fluid in a way we didn't expect. Um, so I don't necessarily want you to think that this is the end all and be all of what story is, but to me this is a model of thinking about story that enables this new kind of story. I think about story as a web of ideas, which sounds like I'm an asset, so I'm going to break that down. The idea, what's the best way to say this? If you take a story, if you take your favorite story, and just not necessarily remove anything, but just cover up, pretend there weren't events that happened, there wasn't a sequence of things that happened. What is that story without that? And to me, it's a lot of different ideas. It's who is this person? Where is this place? Why does this work the way it does? But even more than the idea and the reason I think about story as a web of ideas is it's about the connection between those ideas, right? It's about 
yes, where is this place, but also why is this place the way that it is? And who is this person that's from this place? And how did this place change who this person was and changes the way they're going to react when this antagonistic force comes in? Right, the individual ideas in a story, the individual characters, the individual places are made up. They're not real. But it's the connections and the relationships between those ideas that speak to our reality in the real world, right? It's the way that those things connect to each other that's meaningful to us because we see the relationship between those two things in the real world. So it is the ideas, but it's also the connection of ideas. I like thinking of the story as this web in my head of all of these ideas and places and people and the way they're all connected to each other. And what our job as a storyteller becomes in this way of thinking about it is it's me trying to get the web in my head over to your head. And the reason I like this model for environmental storytelling is it defines sequence differently. Now the sequence isn't the thing we're making, the sequence isn't our story. Instead, in this method of thinking about it, the sequence is the tool that I'm using to get the web of ideas from my head into your head. A sequence is a way of me laying out my ideas one at a time because we can only absorb one idea at a time, right? in a way that I am absolutely sure you're going to be able to absorb in a way that's entertaining and compelling, but that allows you to piece that web back together into your head. So by the end, you have the completed picture. A sequence is a really great tool for communicating that web of ideas over to our player, but we can tell the story in all of the ways you could communicate an idea, potentially. It doesn't necessarily need to be a sequence. So when we're working in an environment, what we want to do is we want to get our ideas from our head over to the player in a lot of different avenues. Yes, you can do that through writing and scenes and dialogue, but you can also communicate ideas through art and animation. And what's delightful about this is that once the player has access to an idea, once they've learned that part of your web, they know it. They don't need it reiterated in some other form. So as an example, once an idea of your story has been communicated through the art, you no longer need to put it in writing. I think a really good example of that is this scene from Limbo, right? There's no writing, there's no words or language anywhere in this to describe what it is you're looking at exactly. But really the image itself gives you enough of a story idea of where this is and what this place is and what happens here. So that once you see this image, you don't necessarily need to have it explained to you in writing. You understand that idea and you can connect it to the other ideas of what this place is and what's happening here. Have I spoken English? Did that make sense? Yes. Cool, cool, great, great, great. So uh, for, for the rest of the talk, I approach environmental storytelling as that idea of you have this story, you have this web of ideas in your head. And really what the process comes down to is one at a time, deciding, okay, I have this idea, this important element of this story. First question is, how do I communicate it? What's the best way for me to give you that idea? Do I just put it in writing so you can read it somewhere? Like, do I put a plaque <laughs> on the wall that you can find? Do I communicate it through art? There's a lot of different options. They all have positives and negatives that may or may not fit the specific idea. But once you have done that, once you have figured out how you're going to communicate all the different ideas in your story, there's then a the question of where do we actually put it? Because remember, we're not working in a sequence anymore. This, page, this idea isn't going to go on page 68. It's going to go in a physical place inside of a physical level. So that's the majority of what I'm going to be talking about. For the first half, I'm going to sort of break down this idea of what's the best way, how are ways, what are ways for us to communicate all of these different ideas. And then once we've gone through that, really get into an actual environment, how do you build an environment that doesn't just have a lot of ideas in it, but actually accumulates into a bigger story as people walk through it. So, broadly speaking, when you have an idea and you're trying to figure out how to communicate it, we'll walk through all of the choices in more detail in a minute. But for the moment, I'm going to break it into two choices. Initially, you kind of want to be thinking of, do I want to communicate this through writing? Or do I want to communicate this through anything but writing? That could be art assets, it could be audio assets, it could be an animation, it could be anything. But I break it into these sort of two big choices. Because I feel like the most important thing anyone can possibly know about writing in a game is that writing and gameplay can't coexist with each other. 
people can't absorb a complex idea and output a complicated task at the same time. And I'll give you an example. Um, in a lot of open world Bioware RPGs, right, a very smart thing that they do is they will notice that once you have been to a place a couple of times, like as an example, a big city, you're going back to, you know, Kirkwall for the billionth time, whatever, and you're just here to turn in this quest, you're just pushing the stick forward on your Xbox, trying to get there, the game will notice, hey, they haven't done anything for a minute. I feel like they're just walking and the characters in your party will start talking to each other to keep you entertained. Maybe it's funny, maybe it's about their backstory, whatever. But because the gameplay is so thin and there is a lot of my brain that I am not using, keeping that stick pushed forward, I have plenty of cerebral space to listen to and absorb that story. In something different, in something very fast paced, something like Overwatch, Call of Duty, where it's really focused, it's really intense, it demands a lot of your attention. If you're in the middle of a crazy gunfight and two people in your party start talking to each other and maybe it's funny, maybe it's about their backstory, heads or tails by the end of that gunfight, you're not going to have any idea what they said. Like you heard it when they said it, you knew the words, but you probably didn't absorb it. So you can't really do both at the same time. That's where I think Anthem had a bit of a problem. Like the writing wasn't bad, but it all happened during gameplay. And so you couldn't listen to it. And then by the end of the mission, you're like, I don't know what that was. I don't know why I did that. I don't know what the point was. When we want our writing to be absorbed and be impactful, we kind of have to ask gameplay to take a step back. And that's not always a bad thing. That can be a very, very good thing. And we'll talk about when that is a good thing. But it also means we need to be careful of two things with our writing. We have to be careful of how much we have. And we have to be careful of where it is. Because we're either going to rip our game player away from the gameplay for too long, or we're going to do it in a moment that's very frustrating and disruptive. So broadly speaking, one of the big advantages of telling your story through your art assets, through your animations, is all those things coexist with gameplay, right? You can be in the environment while you are playing the game. You can be listening to the audio while you are playing the game. That is a big advantage of that. The other advantage of assets and systems is that physical sensory experiences tend to get us to an emotional place much faster than just writing is. Um, like an example, let's say we were all making a game together. And in our game, it is important in our story somewhere for some guy to get shot, as an example. We have roughly two ways we could go about that. Obviously, there's a lot of options within those two ways, but we could put it into writing. We could have a scene in which the player is told that this person gets shot, or we could let them watch it. We could make it happen in the game. And watching that happen, especially if it's very accurate, watching someone's body react slowly to discovering what has happened to them and listening to everyone else piece it together. If it's done in a way that's very accurate, it's going to be really upsetting very quickly, which in this case, let's say that's what we want, right? Physical sensory experiences that I can watch and that I can listen to get me to an emotional state much faster than reading about somebody who happened to get shot. One's not inherently better or worse than the other, but usually people are playing a game because they want the first one. More often than not, if you have an idea in your web, you want to communicate, and really the point of that idea, you want people to feel something about it, that might be a place to put it into an asset or a system, right? We only really talked about the upsides of that. The flip side is that you kind of do need a little bit of writing, first and foremost, <laughs> because writing is really our only tool for conveying information that's complicated, right? In our game where this guy gets shot, there's no way to communicate to the player that he got shot because he was sleeping with the shooter's wife yesterday at seven at the Days Inn off Highway 41. There's no way for me to tell you about that without words getting involved. Words are our only tool for getting complicated information and we're kind of stuck with it. So you can tell a story purely through assets and systems if it's a very simple archetypal story like a journey, right? But if you want to make mass effect, you're going to need to have words get involved at some point. There's no way around that. The other flip side is that writing is also much cheaper to create and much easier to change later on. In our version where this guy gets shot, let's say we have a team meeting and we decide for some reason, it doesn't matter why, that we decide it's not going to be a man anymore, it's going to be someone who identifies as a woman, right? In a scene, 
if you wrote that out, congratulations, all you have assets are more expensive to make and they're more difficult to change afterwards. So if you tell your entire story through assets and systems, and then all of a sudden something isn't working, you can be in a really rough spot. So you usually want to have a bit of a balance between your writing and your assets and your systems. There is no rule that applies 100% of the board across to every game. Games are too different from each other. Racing games are different from music and rhythm games, blah, blah, blah. But a good rule of thumb is that usually what you want to do is you want to use your assets and your systems to help get the player emotional. You want them to feel the way the main character in your story feels right now. Because that emotion is what assets and systems are good at. And then when they're already there, the writing can come in and deliver context and do a lot of really great work in a fraction of the time. So to give you some examples of what that looks like, I'm actually going to pick on a few games. I'm going to be a little mean. They're all really good games, though. That's why I felt comfortable picking them. You should play all of them, which is why I feel a little bit entitled to be nasty. But I just talked really great about Limbo. But it is an example of what happens when you tell your entire story through assets and systems without any kind of writing. The experience of playing Limbo is incredible, right? Because the assets and systems are so intense. You're in this incredible soundscape in this world with that gut-wrenching feeling of watching the little kid die in these grisly death animations over and over and over again. It builds up this really tense, I wouldn't call it wonderful, but from a storytelling perspective, wonderful sensation in you. The problem that I and many other people had with Limbo is you get to the end and there's no writing ever to clarify any of it. You don't really ever know where you are. You don't know who the girl you were following was. You don't know. You don't know what any of it meant. And so I, at least, walked away from Limbo with all of these emotions that I wasn't able to resolve because I felt them being meaningless in the end. And that is, I think, an important point. Emotions aren't entertainment until they're resolved, right? I've been emotional plenty of times. I wasn't having a great time about it. Um, and it's context, usually, that allows us to resolve those emotions, usually writing to come in and give meaning to what you felt is usually a tool you want to have when you tell your stories. The opposite side, if anyone remembers this old gem, is Kingdoms of Adler Reckoning. It's from like 2011, I want to say. Um, fundamentally, it was a really good game, but the problem was that if you wanted to participate in the story, and the story from a high-level idea, not physical thing sense of this is really great. The ideas of what this world is and who all of these people and these cultures are and what's going on here is incredible. But the problem is that in order to participate it, to participate in it, you have to actively say, okay, I'm not going to play the game for a second. I'm just going to sit here and listen to the tens of dozens of things this one guy has to say to me and do my homework and learn what's going on. But what's even more insidious than that is that once you've done that, once you've done all of your homework and you're so excited to go out into this world you now know so much about, you realize I'm just killing a generic goblin with a generic lightning spell and nothing that I'm doing has anything to do with what I just read because none of the assets in the game are connected to the story at all. When your story exists only in your writing, it is in this own little separate bubble that doesn't touch the gameplay. And they both can be good separately, but they never combine to become greater than the sum of their parts. Whether or not this game is your exact cup of tea, you want something that operates similarly to The Last of Us. You want something that uses its assets and systems in the gameplay to get you to an emotional space. If we're talking about Joel, it's that dirty, desperate, I don't like who I am, but I need to be it feeling. And then once you're already feeling that, the writing can come in and do really great work in a short amount of time. If you just watch The Last of Us, the cutscenes on YouTube, they're well written and that there's fine, but it's nothing special. It's the combination of those two forces working together that make the writing so powerful because you arrive at the scene preloaded for it. So what I would like to do very, very briefly is I'm just gonna walk through some of the different options that we have at our disposal, talk a little bit about music, animation, art, just so that everybody has at least one idea of a way you could tell a story through it. These conversations could go on for days, right? We could talk about storytelling and music for forever. That's its own entire talk. So I don't want 
anybody to believe this is the only way you can do it, but at least it's at least one option for all of the channels of communication we have. What I really love about music, I think music and audio more than any other asset is really good at getting people to an emotional place. We feel music more than we feel an animation, right? And that to me makes it a very powerful tool for doing something we've talked about already, for connecting to how that main character feels in this moment. And that can actually be a really powerful tool because I'm gonna show you an example of a song in a game that began a character. It was actually character evolution that was begun by this song and not any of the dialogue leading up to it. This is from Far Cry 3. For anyone who's not familiar with Far Cry 3, the short and not particularly accurate version is that the main character is this guy, 25, 26, Jason, who has a decent enough job, but changes his job every couple of months, has a girlfriend, but keeps breaking up with her because he doesn't know what he wants from life because he can't decide because everything's complicated. So he's going on adrenaline junkie vacations, mountain climbing, skydiving, to sort of postpone making decisions about his life. On one of these vacations, his friends are kidnapped by drug dealers. He has to fight to get them back. But really what the story of Far Cry 3 is, it's about Jason discovering, oh, this works for me. I like violence because violence is simple. Violence is easy for me because it's not complicated. I'm enjoying being in the rush of doing this and not having to make any decisions about my long-term life. And so his character arc is sort of his spiral into this dark place of realizing like, oh, I want to be this bad thing everyone says I shouldn't be. And it's begun by this song. This song is the first time you have any kind of sense that Jason is enjoying being violent in a way you're not wildly comfortable with. There is violence, there is an F-bomb. I'm just warning everybody. This song plays when the mission starts. There's ambient game music happening. When this part of the story starts, this song plays. That dialogue was from the game, yes. Um, but the idea of this is that once you then complete this mission, when you go back to the person who gave it to you, you sat down the flamethrower and Jason says, I love the flamethrower, with like a weird edge in his voice. It's not unexpected. It doesn't come out of nowhere because this music helped you understand the way that that character felt. This music begins his character arc and begins his descent into enjoying violence in a way that he shouldn't have. Again, we could talk about music forever and ever and ever. I'm gonna move on to animation. Uh, I think animation actually, I line these two up back to back. To me, animation does very similar things to what music does, but it can fill in some of the gaps where music can't do it. As an example, that song we just played from Far Cry 3 with Jason, that helps us get into his mindset, that helps us understand who he is and how he feels in that moment, but it only helps us with him. Music only helps us with the main character. It does not inform how anyone else is feeling because they're not the people whose heads we're occupying, right? It also doesn't give us a good sense of what's happening in this exact moment. It gives us a good sense of how they feel about the situation, but we as the developers, we do not know what is happening when second 34 of that track of that song plays. Whereas animation, when an animation triggers, we know exactly what triggered it. So we can use an animation to describe how a character feels about this exact thing that just happened. And it can apply to everybody, not just our main character. I'm gonna walk through uh, a little bit of the animations in The Last of Us and talk about some of them and what I like and what I think they do. It is only fair to point out, I'm very convinced all of these were motion capture, but the point of this is not necessarily how realistic they are, but the little details that are embedded into these animations that are about the storytelling, I think are really valuable. Come on. 
I believe in you. Okay. <laughs> Wash Joel's hands here. I love that little tiny hand clench. That's such a nice idle animation. And you can turn that on or off depending on what level you're in, what environment you're in. But that to me is such a great signifier of like Joel is not comfortable in this place, even though he's peaceful, even though in theory it's beautiful, his thought is it's not safe, what do I do next? Right? That's a great to me signal of what his character is in this situation without any kind of writing. And then Ellie walking up the stairs here is going to have a little animation. Watch your step. Where she just trips. <laughs> and that's, that's where we're headed. Um, <laughs> the little trip is also really nice, especially in contrast to what Joel just did. It's such a nice little touch, but both of those two characters feel very differently about the situation. Joel's active, he's tense, he's scared, he's paying attention. Ellie's not watching where she's going. She's looking around, seeing everything. She's a curious little kid. I'm going to play this sequence. I'm not going to talk much during it. I am going to warn you again. It's going to get very violent and uncomfortable, and that's part of it. That's what we're going to talk about. But it is going to get graphic if anyone would like to leave or not look. Blessings. Take it easy. Take it easy. Fuck. Let him go. Fucking drop him. Shit. Come here. I know that's sad. I got you now, motherfucker. Hey, asshole! Super uncomfortable. But that's what I mean when I talk about assets and systems giving you emotion. Those that grisly, like, I don't like that. I don't like that I just did that. I don't like it. Sensation is what the cutscenes take advantage of when they get started. That's the emotion they want you to feel. I love that there's no music during that because it really allows you to focus on everybody. If there were music in that, it would be about how Joel feels. And part of the storytelling of that sequence that I love so much is it's about everyone. It's about how everyone's terrified of everyone and no one's the good guy in this situation. So. Moving on to talk about art. We're obviously going to talk about more art because we're talking about environments. We'll talk about art a lot in the second half. But to me, what art is really good at is remember, we're not talking about animation, just art. So static. It's about the way things happened before you got here. Things look the way they do because of what happened to them before you looked at them. So to me, art is such a great place to talk about backstory, about what happened both in this place, but also character art, what happened to this person and is that still happening to them? It's a really powerful storytelling tool with art. I, this is one of my favorite examples ever, but this is Elian Lois from Dark Souls 2, one of the DLCs, I think. Um, if you are not familiar with Dark Souls 2, the short, not super accurate version, Elian Lois is this frozen city in the north that nobody has heard from in a while. So something has probably happened there, because in the world of Dark Souls, something has happened everywhere. Something terrible has happened in every single place. But what happened here, we don't know yet. When you first approach the city, there's the gate, there's a bridge leading into the gate. You come at an angle, you approach up the bridge, and when you get to the bridge, you see in front of you these crazy tendrils of ice, like something is trying to claw its way outside of the gate. And that to me does all of the things that we want our art to do. First and foremost, it's emotional, it's chilling, it's creepy, it's interesting. I want to know what that is. But also it's that concrete idea from our story rub, right? That it's really communicated clearly that there's something inside of this city trying to get out and it is being kept there. Right, that hits both of the notes that we want it to hit. Another really great example for me is City 17 from Half-Life 2. 
In Half-Life 1, aliens take over the world. That's what it's about. When Half-Life 2 starts, they have already taken over. You start the game in City 17, aliens rule City 17. Obviously, there's the giant, creepy alien tower, and I love that. That's perfect. But what's more interesting to me for this, what I wanted to talk about, is actually the buildings on the sides. Because to me, they tell a really subtle story that I really love. It's just buildings, all a little bit different, but mostly the same. We were just going along, we were just doing our thing. That one's a bank, that one's a clothes store, until all of a sudden, these things got added. And they all got added at the same time, because they're all made out of the same stuff, these like creepy security structures. But there's no rubble, there's no ruins, there's no smoking bodies, because there was no fight. We were just going along, doing our thing. And now we're still mostly doing that. We're still going along, doing our thing, but just now with this added into it. I think that art really shines when you can talk about all of the things that have led up to this moment and really give the player a feel for what this place has been through. Lastly, it's not super specific to environments, so we're going to go through it very, very quickly, but I want to at least touch on it while we're talking about everything. Gameplay itself can be a very powerful tool for storytelling because gameplay can act as an extension of your main character's behavior, right? This person is choosing to go about this way of getting what they want. Even if it was a choice between do this or die, that person still chose to engage in this behavior and that says something about them. This is what this person is doing, it's something that they care about. And what that means for us is it means that, especially if we're telling a story without a whole lot of words, if we're telling a story without a whole lot of sequence, that a change in the gameplay can also represent a change in that character's behavior. Uh, an interesting example to me is Chell from the first Portal game. Uh, not even mechanically, but just the structure of the way this game works. For a large portion of it, it's very heavily level-based. You're going to do level one, then you're going to do level two, and then guess what you're going to do? You're going to do level three, all the way up until like 16, 17. And to me, what that shows is that this character, you, the player, have no control over what's happening. You are completely controlled by this psychotic robot, and you're going to do whatever she wants because that's the way of it. But at a certain point inside this game, Chell starts to fight back. She finds a way of escaping the experiment laboratory rooms inside of this facility. And the structure of the game changes from something, a very linear level-based, puzzle-based system to not actually a sandbox, but something that feels much more open, something that feels much more spread out, where you have authority to decide where am I going to go, how am I going to escape from this place. And to me, that represents her evolution of her being powerless to her starting to learn how to fight back and control what she wants to do. Another interesting example is uh, Brothers from A Tale of Two Sons. I'm not a million percent on everything this game does, but I think a really cool moment in it involves uh, the way swimming works. Anyone not familiar with this game? Uh, each half of your controller controls one of the two brothers. You control them both at the same time with different fingers. And the younger brother, who I believe is the left half, but I don't know. Let's say he's the left half. The brother, the younger brother on the left half of the controller has no way of swimming. He can't swim yet. So the older brother needs to come get him and bring him across. There's a lot of things that these two characters really rely on each other for. But spoiler alert, I'm going to ruin this game for you. Uh, when the older brother dies, the younger brother discovers he has to be a little bit tougher. He has to learn to do things by himself. And what happens is one by one, new abilities for the younger brother unlock on buttons that used to belong to the older brother. And it's a really interesting signifier for me of showing the way that these characters have changed, not necessarily by writing about it, but by changing the gameplay, changing their behavior, changing how they approach the world. So roughly that's the first half. We could talk for days about all of the different options you have at your disposal, but there's all kinds of different tools that you can use to communicate with your player. Once you have decided how to do that, then there is the question of where are we actually going to put it? How do we organize information, not inside a sequence of things that happen, not inside cutscene one, cutscene two, cutscene three, but inside of an actual physical place. And we're going to do this actually by breaking down two different levels. I'm going to talk about Fort Frolic from the original Bioshock. 
and we're going to talk about a level from Dishonored. But in order to break those down, and I think sort of just go into why I'm making the decisions that I'm making, why we're doing this the way we're doing this, we're going to talk about a couple of narrative design principles, only three really quick, just so that we can understand what it is we're aiming for and why. First, what you're looking at is this is an interest curve. And the idea of an interest curve is that all forms of entertainment, when optimized, will have spikes of intensity in them, followed by periods that allow the audience to relax a little bit, right? Because we want intensity, we want excitement, but also an experience that just keeps getting more and more and more and more and more and more and more intense without a break ever. And you're going to have lost your mind within seven minutes. That's not doable, right? That's too, that's exhausting. So a good piece of entertainment, be it a book, and specifically in this case, a level of gameplay, is going to have spikes of intensity, something that happens really quick and is engaging, exciting, and catches your interest, but then a bit of a period before you can catch your break. And then another one, and then a little bit of a break, up and up, until usually a climactic boss fight, and then a little bit of a breath, a chance for you to recover before you go on to the next level. Those places where we need to relax are a really incredible spot for our writing. Because writing is A, entertaining. Good writing is entertaining, but it also doesn't expect anything from the player. We've all gotten very accustomed to the idea of a cutscene happening after a boss fight, and that evolved because we discovered after a boss fight, players need a little bit of a break. They need to be able to set down the controller. They want to be rewarded with something funny, something engaging, something dramatic, but they also need a second of a break. So rather, I think, than having an eight-minute cutscene at the end of every single level, I think a better strategy is breaking up your writing into little tiny scenelets. They don't even need to be longer than like eight or ten lines but little tiny bits of writing that you can sprinkle strategically throughout your level in places where people are going to need a break from the gameplay anyway. That's going to allow you to have the maximum amount of writing while also not overstepping the bounds of where writing is welcome. Number two is the idea of lingering. The longer a player lingers in a specific area, the more certain I am that they are the kind of player who is going to be interested in extra story content. So let us say we were making an RPG and there's the town, the player arrives in this town and what they need to do right now is they need to go find the king in the castle and talk to them. So they walk into this town, there's an NPC right near the gate. That player goes and talks to this NPC, what should they say? I don't know who this player is yet, right? They just got here, they've only done one thing. I don't know who they are, I don't know what they care about. Are they someone who is interested in story? Are they someone who's interested in collectibles? Are they just like words gross? Why are you talking at me? I just want to murder things. Who are they? I don't know. So the first thing this NPC should probably say should generally be about the gameplay. It should be probably here's directions to the castle where you're going to go to because that's something everybody's interested. Now, if that player talks to that NPC again, oh, you already know what you're supposed to be doing. You know how I'm expecting you to do it. So you're just exploring. You're just interested in extra stuff. OK, maybe I talk about the politics of the castle a little bit. Maybe I foreshadow what's going to happen when you get there. That player talks to this NPC a third time. Well, you just want to see everything. You want to hear everything that everybody has to say. So now the gates are open. Let's talk about the history of how this town founded, right? The longer a player lingers in an area, the safer it is for me to assume they're going to be interested in extra bits of storytelling that they don't strictly need. And then lastly, we have the idea of story as a part of the feedback loop. The feedback loop is the physical process by which somebody plays a game. So in our case, they take an action, which for us means usually they press a button. That action has an effect within the world of the game because they press the button, they successfully attacked this goblin. But the loop isn't complete until the player is informed about the effects of their actions through feedback. The player doesn't know that they've successfully attacked a goblin until we have a little animation play, the goblin yells in a sound effect, and the blood texture shows up on the floor. That's when the player understands the consequences of what they've just done and are equipped to take another action. The reason that I bring this up is that story tends to do its best work when it is working as a form of feedback. Story is most powerful 
when it is about something that the player has done or is about to do and the consequences of their actions on the story. You are going to have bits of your story that don't fit into the feedback loop, and that's fine. Not everything needs to, but the pieces of story that do fit into the feedback loop have the extra benefit of giving emotional weight and emotional significance to the gameplay. It's the bits of story in the feedback loop that are going to help people feel something about the, what they are doing. So we want to have both. We're going to have story that's not always a part of this, but the story that does fit into that, the bits of the story that are about you and what you're doing and the consequences of it are going to be probably of a higher priority to us than the bits of the story that don't. So with those three things in mind, what we want to do is we want to start organizing these ideas so we can figure out where to put it in our level. And we're going to do that we're going to kind of juggle things. We're going to kind of juggle two different things. First and foremost is just understanding how important is this bit of the story to me. And I do that in terms of the feedback loop. There's no right, wrong way to do this. This is a method of organizing content in the level I'm very fond of. I only use four because that's enough for me. It could be five, six, whatever. But I organize it this way. Anything to me, any idea in my story web that is absolutely critical. You cannot possibly miss this information. You will have no idea what's going on or why it matters. It's going to be a one. And that to me is something that I have to make sure you see. So it has to be somewhere you can't miss it. And that also helps me in some ways to find like, how do I want to communicate this idea? Because some, some methods of communicating are more missable than others. For me, this either has to be in writing, you can't skip, it has to be in the cutscene, it has to be in the sequence we're making, or it has to be embedded in the gameplay somehow. Embedded in the system, embedded in a specific moment that happens, whatever, but it has to be in one of those two things because they're not missable. To me, anything that is a two is something that is extra. You don't technically need to know this to understand the story, but it does fit into the loop. It is about what you are doing. It is about something that I have found very important and that, to me, is a two. I like to write out my twos. And the reason for that is if this information is important to me, I want to make sure you understand it. And that goes back to that idea that writing is really our only tool for conveying very complicated information. Like if we go back to City 17, right? Very cool storytelling done in those side buildings. But there's no guarantee that the player is going to translate and understand that the exact way we will want them to. That's open to interpretation. And that's beautiful. But if an idea is important enough to me, I want this idea to be very clear to you. So these ideas are important to me. I'm willing to use what I think of as my writing budget, the amount of writing that's appropriate for this experience. I'm willing to use some of that budget on those ideas. Three, to me, is anything that uh, isn't necessarily directly in the feedback loop, but is related to characters that are. So maybe it's not about something specific you're going to be doing, but it's about this boss you're going to see. Right, it's about, it's connected to what you are doing, but not quite as directly as the twos. And that's where I start to go, okay, is this worth writing? Or is this something that I obviously want in the game? I want in the world of my story because it richens everything up and makes it a better experience. But is it something that I now try to communicate through something that's not writing? Do I try to communicate this through art or animation? And then once I get to a four, anything that's about Characters that aren't particularly connected or the setting, to me, that's not worth writing about. To me, that's something I want to have, but I want it to be in the environment. I want players to feel it, and if they understand it in a very concrete way, great, but that's less important to me. That is one of these two things we are balancing. We are balancing at any one moment how important this idea is to us overall. And the second thing we are doing is a little... <laughs> It's a little specific, but we want to curate an image. What we don't want to have happen is we don't want our web of story ideas to only be satisfying at the very end when we just put everything together, right? Because that's not fun. We want the story to be compelling the entire way through. I want to be interested in the story for five minutes in. I want to be interested in it the whole way through until the end. And that means, like, as an example, we don't want to start by throwing seven random ideas that are not connected to each other at the player, right? They're not going to remember all of those. They're not going to be able to connect them to anything. What we want to do is we want to start by curating pictures, start with, like, a couple of ideas that connect to each other and give people a sense of what's going on. 
and then we want to evolve that in a way that is interesting over time. And a very, very good structure for doing that is the three act structure. And I'm sure some of you might be thinking, you just spent the first 10 minutes of your talk talking about how we weren't gonna have a sequence. Why are you a filthy liar? And the answer is that we are not gonna have a sequence as writers, right? As writers, as designers, we don't know exactly what the player is going to do or when. But ultimately, all gameplay experiences are a sequence. It does not matter how open the structure of your game is, people are going to experience your game as first A happens, then B happens, then C happens. We just don't know what those are. We don't know what they're gonna do, what they're gonna do in what order. But the player experience is still going to be a line. And if we're telling a story across that line, this idea of evolving our picture can still be very helpful to us. We just have to take a step back from the specifics. So as an example, let's say we were making a game, we were gonna use this to determine the trajectory of how we're going to evolve our story, even though it doesn't have a specific plot. It's less important that the mentor meets the hero character on page 17, nobody cares. But what we wanna do is we wanna take a step back and go, what is act one about? What are all of the things in act one doing to get people interested in this idea, to get people interested in this concept? And when you think about that for a second, really what act one becomes about is it becomes about context. It's about understanding what this world is and what all of these other forces are without the main plot problem first, right? You spend a little bit of time with Frodo in the Shire before you learn that the ring is a big deal. So that when the conflict enters and everything changes, we understand that change because we have something to compare it to. We understand what it was that was changing first. Act one is about context. It's about setting everything up so you understand what's about to happen. And it's also it's about stakes. It's about why should I care about what's happening? So in our level, no, we don't know exactly what ideas people are going to encounter first. But the first couple of ideas they find should be act one ideas to help them curate this image of what this place is and how it works. And while these exact things that happen, the mentor needs to die on page 95, those things are less important to us, but it can give us a trajectory of A, what we need in order to find things interesting, what do we need in order to care about the story, because those are all of the things that happen in Act 1. And then what is a psychologically interesting way of evolving that story that keeps us all interested over time. So even though we do not have a specific plot, what we want to do is we want to arrange our information inside of our level. Once we understand how players move through our level and we discover what roughly they're going to find in what order, we want to lay down our ideas so that it's easier for them to assemble a picture in their head. And then we create the entertainment of a story by manipulating that picture and adding new information. Oh, it's not exactly what you thought it was because now it's this and isn't that interesting. We're doing a bit of both of those at the same time. So we're gonna talk about, we are going to talk about two different types of levels. We're gonna talk about linear or alley levels. That's where we're gonna talk about Bioshock. I'm defining those as levels where there's a finite number of ways to get from the beginning of the end, level to the end. And then we're gonna talk about open world sandbox island levels where there is an infinite number of ways to get from one place to another. We're gonna start with linear levels because those are much easier to work with. So we're gonna cover the basics of what we wanna do then and then adapt it to open world levels later. The first big advantage when you're working in a linear level is that purely because you have less content, you can spend more time adding details to things. And details are where story exists. Uh, in Bioshock, as an example, one of the delightful things about that game is every enemy encounter, every battle is planned and has a story attached to it. The enemies you are going to fight are always doing something when you find them. Maybe they're working together, maybe they're like planning to ambush another person, maybe they're planning to ambush you and they just don't realize you're there. But there's always a story of what's going on and how this place works. And they were able to add that because the programmers had extra time because they weren't making 20 other encounters that day. The less content you have, the more specific it can get, and the more specific it can get, the more of a story you can tell of it. Next, it is much, much easier to tell your story through your assets and systems and art and animation in linear levels. Because you are, again, making less content, open worlds 
levels have much, much more to make, which means at some level, your assets are going to have to be reusable, which means they're going to have to be less specific, which means they're going to do less storytelling with them. In linear levels, especially if you know the player is going to have to see this, they're going to have to walk through this room, it is the only possible way they can get through the end of the level, you can afford to spend a chunk of change making a giant giraffe or making a really cool storytelling asset that creates a powerful moment. And you don't have to be concerned about whether it was a waste of money because not everybody's consumed. Lastly, uh, linear levels, I think, do a really great job of offering immersion, which is just a way of saying that people get really into it. That sense when you're watching a movie and it's so good that you forget who you are and you forget that you're in your living room watching a movie or playing a book and your roommate comes in and scares the crap out of you because, because you forgot about real life for a minute, that's a very immersive game. And what's delightful about linear levels is because we, the designers, have such overt control over everything. We can offer you subtler control in ways that don't necessarily have a lot of concrete impact, but that feel really great. Like in Half-Life, one of the things they did, they were very, very famous for it, is they never take control of the camera away from you. You are always in control of your character. You can always do and look wherever you want, and the story will happen in front of you. But it's able to do that because it is basically a real shooter. I know you are going to walk into this room. I know you are gonna go through that door because that is the only option available to you. And when you open that door, I know where you will be, I know where you will be looking, and I can make something happen in front of you. I don't need to take control of the way, or I don't need to take control of the camera away from you. The very last thing that we'll talk about before we get into the levels is less uh, a design thing and more just a feature that oftentimes linear levels will have called fingers. Even in a linear level, like you can see in this one, you start up here, you sort of move down, you go over there, that's the end of the level. There's still, even if it's a linear level, a lot of optional areas, a lot of optional content to explore. What is this whole thing? What's this over here? Linear levels still have side juts in them, but these are what I call fingers, the little offshoots from the main path of your linear level. And we're going to use those. Those are going to be important in how we structure our content. So we're gonna talk about Fort Frolic. This graphic is a lot, I know. I couldn't figure out a better way of walking through a 3D level on a 2D sheet of paper. So I'm just gonna walk you through what this looks like. Um, we will go through it sequentially. We'll talk about what happens in the level in the order in which it happens. But the red dots are all big main plot events. And the number inside of those is the number in which they happen. So first, Number one happens over here, then you this walk over answer. here to number two, and only once number two has happened does number three happen. That is the idea of the red dots. They are the sequence of things that Bioshock decided to have, and we will talk about those. Blue dots are optional bits of writing, and the number inside of the blue dots is the priority of where they were. They are how directly related to the gameplay are they? How no, high on our list of priorities are they? And the green dots are more environmental storytelling. They're art assets, they're audio assets, they're animation. Purple dots are just oh gameplay God. rewards. They could be a chest of money, they could be a weapon upgrade, whatever. So let's walk through this. Let's talk through the first level of Bioshock and see how they arrange these bits of ideas in their story. What happens when you arrive, you get out of your submarine back to Spear Subway Station, and your good friend Atlas, who will never betray you, calls you on the radio, and he says, "There's you need to get out of Fort Frolic right now. There's this crazy artist named Sander Cohen. If you stay there too long, you can and the call cuts out. You go, okay, I'm going to do that. You walk over to number two to try to exit, and you get a call from Sander Cohen saying he's blocked off the bathosphere because he's curious about you. You head back to number three. You are ambushed by three spider splicers, Cohen's minions, after that fight. He says, ooh, you're really interesting. I want to meet you. Come meet me at Fleet Hall. This door unlocks. You enter the lower atrium. Four is really a piece of environmental storytelling to me. What that represents is when you first walk in, all of the neon lights of the entertainment district of the city light up one at a moment. It's a very cool emotional beat, and it does happen every time, so I included it in this. But what you will notice is that in none of this area is there anything other than red dots. There is no extra environmental storytelling. There's no extra writing anywhere in that. And the reason is because people have not lingered yet. I don't know who this is. I don't know if they're interested. I don't know if they're going to pay attention. 
Instead, all of the extra stuff is in this first finger that opens up down here. And what you will notice is that at the base of this finger, these two are right next to each other. We give you a lot of relatively important information pretty quickly. And then the deeper into the finger you go, the lower down my list of priorities I'm going. That's because the deeper people venture into a finger, the fewer and fewer people are going to see it. The balance of that is that this little purple dot up here, this is a bit of money, I think, but this is a weapon upgrade. This is arguably the most important gameplay reward in the game. As we get deeper and deeper into the finger, we're going lower down our list of narrative priorities, but we're also upping the gameplay rewards for people who venture further and further in to sort of counterbalance those two things. We are doing this, we are going down our list of priorities, but the other thing that is happening is we also want to make sure all of these dots are curating a specific story, right? These are all act one dots for this level. This is all me giving you a sense of what this place is and how it works so that later on I can start to disrupt that. So we're organizing it in two different ways. Regardless of whether or not the player goes down this finger, eventually they go to Fleet Hall. At point five, you have to wait for an elevator. You are attacked by four spider slicers. Eventually you win. You go up the elevator, and because it is a linear level, and when those elevator doors open, I know exactly where you are. I know exactly where you're looking. I can make something happen in front of you. At this point, you open the elevator doors to see Sandra Cohen Stewart at a piano with dynamite wrapped around him playing a song. He makes a mistake, he blows up, and Sandra goes, okay, take a picture, here's a camera, take a picture of his body, meet me back at the lower atrium, and I'll tell you what we're up to. You come back here 2.7, at this point, the broader story of the level opens up, and he says, I am making this piece of art, I have three students in Fort Frolic left alive, find them, kill them, take their pictures, paper mache them onto my art to complete it, and then you can now leave Fort Frolic. At this point, this door opens up, and when you get 2.8, you are attacked by six spider splicers. And this is where that interest curve starts coming into play. Because there's never more than one fight back to back without a bit of writing to break it up. And there's also never too much writing at one moment without a bit of gameplay to break it up. The gameplay challenges are ramping up over time, but after each one, you get a little bit of a break. There's a little bit of storytelling, so it's not all happening at once before we continue on. Now the rest of the red dots are less important. Um, it plays itself out, you find all of Sandra Cohen's students, but in the second half of the environment, you open up into sort of a shopping mall. And what happens is you see all of these different individual fingers that are like stores, all of these different optional things for you to look into. And each one of them, almost universally, has two different types of dots. It has two different types of rewards for people. So we're never leaving you with your least favorite thing. If you're not particularly observant, if you're not paying attention to the environment, we're not leaving you with just environmental storytelling. We're also giving you a little bit of writing or giving you a gameplay reward, right? And these fingers do combine into bigger stories. Like as an example, Sinclair Spirits and the basement number G are connected. The staircase opens once you have explored Sinclair Spirits, and it is structured to tell a story almost along the lines of a traditional three-act structure. We're still using that idea of how to evolve information over time. We just aren't getting specific about exactly what is happening exactly when. I also don't speak English. Have I spoken English? Does anyone have questions before we move on to open world stuff? Delightful. Yeah. With, with these numbers, um, so if they're out of, out of order, is it that like doors are locked and you can't go? Or is like, can I see nine before I see eight for like the reds? Oh, uh, the door unlocks here as an example. At this point, you're attacked. At this point, there's a little bit of dialogue with this guy who will then attack you. These happen in order. So like as you can, you can't get into here to experience 10 until eight has happened. So it's like, it, it isn't like you attempt to backtrack to get to certain parts. Uh, yes, in this level, yes, you definitely do. Uh, cool, so then let us talk about open world stuff. We already talked almost about the flip side about how assets are much more easy to use, much more enabled in linear levels. In open world levels, you really have to rely on your writing. Just from a technical perspective, from a budget perspective, your assets need to be more reusable, which means you need to have the actual 
cheap, very easily changeable process of writing in order to give context to individual situations around the world. It's not your art that's doing that for you, it's usually your writing. So when we look at Dishonored, you're gonna see a lot more blue dots than usual. And I'm not hyped about that from an experience point, but just from a budget production standpoint, there's no way around that. That's the only feasible option when you're making a game that's not big. What's next? Oh, right. Also, another problem that we have is, in theory, every spot on an open world map is equally viable. We do not have rooms that are particularly important. We do not have fingers branching out that players may or may not go to. How are we going to arrange our information in a way that accumulates when any one spot is not necessarily better or worse than any other spot? And the answer to that is you usually want to use some form of indirect control. People who are not familiar with indirect control, the idea is that I, as the designer, am not forcing anyone to do anything. Instead, I am creating a situation in which it is easier for me to predict what most people will do. A very dramatic example that I don't suggest doing, but it gets the point across, is if I was making an open world game and I handed you this map, and I said, you can go anywhere you want. That is totally true, and I bet I know where most people are going to go first, because what the hell is that? Right? I'm not, I'm not making anyone do anything. I'm engineering a situation in which what people are going to do is easier for me to predict. A much subtler, much better example of that in the level we're going to talk about is Dishonor, which uses an object called the heart of a living thing. The idea of this object is when you have it equipped and you hold it where you would normally have like a spell or a weapon. So it's something you don't have out all the time. But when you want to, you can take it out. And while you are holding it, you see the location of different upgrades and objects of interest to you across the map. There are two that this reveals. There are runes, which are basically skill points where you level up your supernatural abilities. And there are bone charms, which work like rings in most games, where they have a little subtle benefit, but you can only have a certain number of them equipped. Runes are arguably more valuable than bone charms. So what this does is it creates a situation where I find it a little bit easier to predict what you're going to do because this object exists in the game and I think you will take advantage of it. The dots here are a little different. I'll go through it super quickly. Because there is less writing, every green dot, I scoured through this game to find everything when I was making this. Every green dot in here is a four. It is not about the main characters. It is not connected to the loop in any way. We need to have more writing. And what I found when studying this game is that writing absorbed the threes. Anything that was about a main character became written because we needed to have more writing than environmental stuff. Uh, in the purple, in the purple dots, I have an R's for runes, which are arguably first priority, asterisks for bone charms, arguably second priority. And then there are still, you'll see some like pockets of things scattered around, but there is nothing guiding to them. The heart of the living thing is not taking the player here. It doesn't point that out. But what this does, oh, lastly, sorry, orange dots are side quests. Bioshock didn't have side quests, that's why it didn't have orange. So when you start in the first level of Dishonored, you start here. If you are only interested in blazing through in the main quest, you're going to walk up the street and head over here to the overseer, the person you're supposed to kill. But if you are interested in lingering, I bet the first thing you're going to do is you're going to take out your heart of a living thing and you're going to go after the nearest room, which it does offer numbers on the screen. If you look, it will show that is 200 video game meters away, not a real distance. But the closest room from here is here. I bet you're going to walk down this street into this building and run smack dab into the first side quest in the game. I am using this form of indirect control to guide you to the environments and the part of the environments that I care about the most. So let's say you did that. Let's say you go accept this side quest. At this point, a character named Granny Rags suggests that, hey, the local thugs in the distillery have really been bothering me. What I would like you to do is I'd like you to find a plague-infested dead rat from the doctor's office and drop it off in the distiller to kill all the people in the distillery. And you're a psychopath, so you agree. You go to the doctor's office. What's interesting to me about the doctor's office and how this is laid out is that all of these floors are immediately accessible. A player can technically start on all of them. Anybody with a working brain can walk through the first door. 
anybody who's willing to do a little bit of first person platforming can hop up to a window on the second floor and entering right here. And only players who have purchased a specific upgrade can immediately start on the third floor, but you'll notice all of the numbers are appropriate for the amount of people who are seeing it. The floor that is gonna see the least number of people because the dead rat you're looking for is up here. The number of people who are going to see these fours is smaller than the people who are going to see the threes is smaller than the group of people who are going to see the twos. Everybody's going to see the twos. The other thing worth pointing out is while there's a lot of writing going on here and not much environmental storytelling, and part of that is because of the way this environment is structured. All of these rooms are very closed off from each other, right? When you are in here, you do not see what is in here. When you're in here, you don't see what's over here. And so a lot of the environmental storytelling in this place is very easily missed because it is so contained. This changes once you grab the rat and head over to the distillery, a very open, open map that you can sneak around. And now you'll see the opposite. Now you'll see, okay, there's a couple of bits of writing gathered around the thing that I'm eventually going to get to. So there is a little pocket of narrative content that I am driving you to with indirect control. But in these big, big open areas, you're seeing mostly environmental storytelling, and that's because it's so open you can see it. Right In this big open map, there is much less of a chance you will walk up to a piece of writing and pick it up. But regardless of how you decide to stealth your way through this entire area, you're going to see what's going on here because it's visible from everywhere. In big open areas of these maps, there's usually more of a focus on environmental storytelling. What can you see? What can you hear? And in the closed down maps, the environmental storytelling is more expensive and less powerful than it usually is. So you usually want to focus more on writing. Did that all make sense? Anybody have questions? Excellent. So briefly summarizing, remember we're starting with an idea web. We figure out how we want to communicate all of those individual ideas. But then when we organize content, we're doing it by these two things. We're doing it both in terms of how important is this to the feedback loop? How much do I care about this piece of the story? But also how can I organize all of this information? in a way where I understand most people move through the level like this. So I'm going to lay out the ideas in a way that will accumulate for them in a really interesting, compelling way. In linear levels, you're usually using fingers to determine whether or not people are linking, lingering. In an open level, you usually want to have some form of indirect control. That said, there is still one final step before I feel like you're done with your environment, because we've done a lot of work already. We've gotten a lot of ideas planted. We've arranged them all specifically, but at this point, your environment's still very static. It's placed and organized in a way that makes a lot of sense, but it doesn't feel alive. Nothing happens as you move through it. You want to look for ways for your environment to react to your player, because to me, that is almost the most important form of storytelling, of not just what influence does the player have on this world, but also how does this place react to what the player has chosen to do. That's also an interesting story. And that revolves around the feedback loop. And specifically, what I do to start sort of working out how I want this to happen, I start thinking about actions. And I go through a dreadfully dull process that I call verbing. And it is literally getting all of the verbs, all of the things that players can do in your game onto a list. Because every single thing the player can do is a potential opportunity for your environment to, to react to it. So what can the player do? Can they fight? If they fight, how do they fight? Can they punch? Can they shoot? Can they run? Can they die? Can they open things? Can they use things? Can they take off all of their clothes? What are all of the things that they can do? Because then you can decide in each one, is there an instance in which the world can react to you doing this one in a way that is interesting and livens up what's happening? Um, We've talked a little bit about Dark Souls already, but that's such a great example to me because dying is such an important verb in Dark Souls. It's a verb that most games overlook. When you die, they pretend it didn't happen and dump you back on the <laughs> title screen so that you never die. But in Dark Souls, the way the world reacts to death, what happens after you die and why, is a crucial part of the story of that place. Even in something as simple as The Last of Us, the verb of taking hostages and the way all of those people 
react to that through their animation is very clever, very specific storytelling that was all designed. But it was designed because there was an action that was interesting to the context of this world, and that world reacted to the player taking that action. So broadly speaking, you have your idea web, you figure out how you want to communicate each idea in your web, you figure out where you want to put it inside of your level, and then you find opportunities for your level for the things in that environment for the characters, the place itself maybe, to react to the player. And I am completed. <laughs> <laughs> Where are we on time? How good are we? I always uh, talk faster than I think I'm going to. A little bit before eight, it's five to eight. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that was quicker than I thought because we also we started late. But does anyone have any questions? This is a good question. Yeah. What about um, stories where the writer purposely, like, we were talking about like finding audio clues or notes, mm -hmm. purposely um, tells the story out of order? Is that preferred? Is that bad? Is that trickier? It's trickier, but what I will also say is people think, oftentimes people think that it's the information in your story that's interesting, but what's actually most interesting about your story is the absence of specific bits of information. So telling a story out of order can be confusing, but it can also be very tantalizing if there's one piece of information that everyone knows is very important, but we don't know exactly what that is. It's our curiosity, it's our drive to try and figure out what is that that makes us lean into the story. So it is more complicated to tell a story out of order, but especially if we're talking about environmental storytelling. Environmental storytelling, again, because it's going on through the environment, it's going on through a lot of environment parts, is almost always about something that has happened already. Like if you look at the Dark Souls games, as an example, famous for environmental storytelling, or even like Prey, the recent Prey did a really good job of it. The environmental storytelling is almost exclusively about things that have already happened. So in that way, you can sort of break up history and organize it however you want. Um, I will say like in the case of the Dark Souls games, as an example, those the way in which you accumulate information in those games is almost so out of order that it can be very, very difficult to like put fractured. together. Yeah, of like I remember like I love the Dark Souls stories and I appreciated them now, but I had to have my friend explain them to me. So I was like, I don't know who this person is. I've seen this name twice, but I don't remember where and I don't remember what it was in relation to. And that's why I think the idea of like, whatever the image is, as long as you can curate it first, and as long as every piece of information you have after that adds onto it somehow, in a way that's easier for me to remember, I think you can, like the technical order of when it happened in the history of your world is less important. Cool. Anybody else? It's gonna be a short night, yeah. Um. Yeah, I guess I was just wondering in terms of like the pacing, how exactly would you go about iterating in terms of like the experience for the player? Mm -hmm. You know how you were saying how there have to be moments of intensity and then mm -hmm. moments of pause? Yeah. So it seems kind of like difficult to be able to manage that if you're just writing the script. When you're just writing like, oh, I want this event to happen. And then oh, absolutely. That. What I, I actually would say is probably the most important thing trying to figure out how far back do I go on this one. Let's go there, let's talk about it. Roughly to me, at least in my experience, there's sort of four phases of developing a story for a game. There's the concept phase happens first where you get all your ideas. If you know you're doing environmental storytelling, you're getting your web together. What are my ideas? What are the relationship between them? Then there's the implementation phase that happens next. And that is literally putting together the plan of how I'm going to tell my story. That's where all of this stuff is happening. Um, writing the script happens after that. After you, after you have your plan together, that's when you create the content. After you've created your content, that's where you test it. So usually what you want to do is you want to get together with your level designer as soon as you possibly can before they have anything figured out. So you can have that conversation of like, what do you want to have what's important to you to have but also i want to communicate this 
and especially presenting that idea of what you want to communicate in this place. What are the important parts of Fort Frolic to me, to your designer? And then have that conversation of how do we do both of these at the same time? How do we create gameplay challenges that are fun and are also taking us to places and involving us in activities that communicate ideas about the story? In my experience, the faster you can get together with them, the better. Um, and then testing is always a rough, painful process, but that's just what testing a level always is. Usually it ends up in a lot of work being thrown out a lot of the time. And to a certain extent, that's unavoidable, but having a good plan in place early before you write anything, because especially uh, the other element of that, of like if I know vaguely what I want to do in this level, but I don't know what the level is yet, I don't know what to write. I don't know my scenes. I don't know where they are. I don't know what's happened just now. So it's almost impossible to write the script when you're telling your story in this way until you have gotten together with your level designer. Did that answer your question? Did I yeah, make no, sense? Okay. Well. okay, okay, okay. <laughs> can, can I just ask one more question? Please, okay. please. Um, so uh, another thing that I was thinking about was like, in terms of you writing, you have like your own sort of bias for how you want the pacing to be, but that mm -hmm. may not be relevant to your audience. Mm -hmm. And it seems difficult to really know like, oh, is this going to be too fast or too much or too slow? Mm -hmm. I don't know. I mean, it's tricky because in especially a lot of other writing, that's why there is genre conventions, like in novels. That's why there is a fantasy genre. We have figured this audience out. We know what they want. That's why there are rules placed on that genre, not necessarily because they need it to be a good story, but because that's what fits the audience that this is going after. It is trickier in gameplay, but that's just because gameplay usually revolves around a gameplay genre instead of a story genre. So as an example, like if you were making a first person shooter, regardless of the story genre, like regardless of whether it's a first person shooter horror game or whether it's a first person shooter romance game, it's going to be after that same target audience. So really it's just doing your market research. And especially if you're working at a big studio, there's usually an editor or a narrative producer who can help you do that. But it really is about understanding your audience in advance, seeing the other things that are out there in the market, what has done well and why. That makes sense. Okay. Yeah. So I'm not a good guy, so I always okay. talk about your stuff. But, uh, Please. I guess one question I have is, do you find that there's a, well, there, there probably is, but how, how do you go about balancing the amount of voice acting content versus mm -hmm. written content? I would imagine that plays into like what, you know, obviously budget goes into that. Mm -hmm. Voice acting costs money. Yes, uh, yes it does. You know, how would you I mean, my approach to it as a writer is that is that a bad actor can ruin a great script just as much as a bad script can't be saved by a great actor. So my approach is usually unless you can afford to do it well, unless you can afford to have the voice acting you want, just don't have it. Just don't do it. Um, I mean, it gets trickier in like especially big MMO games. Like I touched on Final Fantasy XIV recently and ultimately decided it wasn't for me, but had a lot of fun in the little bit of time that I played. And I noticed the voice acting in that was very, very sporadic. And I could tell it was because they wanted to have it for the big climactic moments of their story. But also in the beginning of the story in an MMO where you're like, there's three rats, how about it? <laughs> like the amount of voice acting was so sparse it was really jarring to me when it did happen it took me out of the experience so i would say the bare minimum you can have you don't necessarily need to have it all of the time but i'd say you want to be able to have enough of it where it's in a pattern that's predictable so players are going to know i'm going to have they're going to talk now or they're not going to because of the type of scene this is and how i entered it i already understand i already understand a little bit how it's going to play out because that surprise that shock really can pull them out of the experience cool okay yeah. yes nice last question um do you find yourself playing a game and the story lets you down lets you down horribly so mm -hmm. much, but you enjoy the gameplay that when you're done with it, you find yourself rewriting the story for yourself. Yeah, yes. <laughs> um, I mean, I did that. What I will say is that, especially 
I've been doing this for eight years now. And when I say I'm doing this for eight years now, I mean, I've been doing this for five years now. And then I catered for three years. <laughs> so during those early years where I was really fighting for it and really hungry for it, I played a lot, a lot of story games. I was very interested in them because I was trying to learn. So like, I remember I had a game whose gameplay I really loved, Dragon's Dogma, if anyone remembers that. And the writing is ungodly. I don't, it's so awful. It's like, it's a mess. I don't even know what's happening and why. And I do remember being like, this would be a really good activity for me to do right now. It'd be really interesting for me to like break this down and see if I could fix it. Um, in a way, that's actually great practice because I found that at least when you're working in games, there's so many other things happening. There's so many other pieces in play that, A, your story could change on a dime any day. Someone could just come in and be like, you don't have an act two now, so figure out what your story is. And that has happened to me more than once. Just sudden big changes because something changed. Um, but the other factor of that is there's so many other things happening. You always kind of have to be aware of that. I found it's very important to be very cerebrally aware of your story, to really understand it in a mechanical engine-like way. Um, a lot of writers and a lot of other media, are they call themselves pantsers. And the idea is they make it up as they go. They follow their heart as they write their story. And I think that's fine if you're writing a novel. But in a game, if something changes and all of a sudden a huge chunk of your story gets ripped away, you really have to understand exactly what you lost and exactly what it affects so that you understand how to replace it with something. So the core of that story is I do that less now than I used to now more often than not. If a game is bad, I'll just go, that's a shame uh, and wait for something that's better that can teach me something. But especially when I was first getting started, even just thinking very clearly about the bad games was really very helpful because it allowed me to start piecing together what I believed about story. Like I remember in Dragon's Dogma learning a lot and being like, why do I think this is a problem? Why do I think this is a problem? And what would I do to fix this problem that connects to what I changed over here? I found that that skill set becomes very important. When you're working in an environment that's very chaotic, you don't have a month to go find the heart of your story again. If you lost it, you have to be able to think about the problem and solve it. Anybody else? Yay! <laughs> cool, thanks guys. Uh, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> Learned that lesson last time.